Hi, and welcome to this second part in our series of videos that's all about jigs and fixtures. Now, today, oddly enough, we're not going to be working on jigs and fixtures. And that is because a jig or a fixture is used to perform machining operations or secondary machining operations on semi-finished parts. That would mean that if we're going to be designing and producing different jigs and fixtures in this series, we're going to need a set of semi-finished parts, and that's what we have right here. So this is going to be our semi-finished parts that we're going to be producing jigs for in order to drill holes, cut more angles, whatnot. We'll see what we'll do as time goes by. Today we're going to be using our shaper, or I'm going to be using my shaper, my mill, and my cutoff bandsaw to produce these blank parts. Now the shape is basically rectangular, so it's a very simple part. And the tolerance is, well, all the two decimal dimensions have a tolerance of plus or minus five thou, and the three decimal dimension, the only one right here, has a tolerance of plus or minus one thou. And the angle here, well, it has a tolerance of one half of a degree. So let's get to it and go find some stock for these parts. So a quick look around my uh, scrap box when I found this piece of, uh, well, what's a piece of an old boilerplate? It's a uh, rough steel, but it's what we'll be using to produce our part.
So, my part is in the vise. I haven't moved it. Uh, I've measured it and I know that it's nice and parallel and that I need to take another 15 thousandths of an inch off here. Uh, that's not very much. That's going to be a finishing cut. I've been roughing up till now and I've been feeding up into the tool using my table, which isn't the most accurate way. So, my table is fixed where it was at the last cut. I adjusted my table support here and lubricated it. It's ready to go. And, well, I'm ready to cut. But I'm going to be using this axis here. It's much more accurate. And it has an accurate graduated scale. So my last 15 thou I'll take off here. Now I've already set it to zero and I'll take 15 thou off for this cut. Now these machines really throw chips. Safety glasses are very, very important. I mean they always are, but this is particularly dangerous and messy. I mean I've been finding chips 20 feet away at the other corner of the shop. So I'm going to set up here my chip pan and all it is really is just a pan with two tongs. I don't get excited I didn't say thong. The two tongs here that insert into the T-slots. Now that'll help catch a lot of those uh, wayward chips but it cuts the camera view so that's why I don't usually use it. So I'll bring the camera in sideways for the, this next shot and we're going to watch that 15 thou finishing cut. Now, through the magic of videos, the primary surfaces have magically been machined. Actually, we started with our secondaries and we did our primaries after. You didn't see that because I didn't record it because it's the same process that I went through for the secondaries. So we'll save a little time here. But we do end up with a nice squared up piece of stock to produce the parts I want to produce. But there's something missing on this shape and that's a 45 degree angle. I want to do it now because it will really speed up things uh, compared to putting a 45 on each of the individual parts at the end. So I'm going to put a 45 on here. Now if I had an inclinable vise I could do it on the milling machine quite easily. I could even file it on if I wanted. Uh, but I've been having fun with my shaper. I don't use it that often. So we're going to do it here. Now, like I said, I don't have an inclinable vise that's rigid and I don't have a sign uh, plate. So I'm going to have to become a little creative to hold this at 45 degrees. And well, here's what I figured out. To make this setup, we're going to need a small parallel, a little slightly larger parallel, we're going to need two small V-blocks and one large V-block. And, well, obviously, the part that we're going to machine. So, I'm going to start with the small parallel. And it's not really used in the setup. It's just to support my small V-blocks while I'm producing the setup. Now, I've already figured all this out. It's not magic. It took me a good 10 minutes to find everything that I needed. So, small parallel down in that corner. We're going to flip our v-block over here. Now everything has been cleaned ahead of time so there's no uh, straight chips here or dust that's going to throw me off. Now what I want to do really is hold this part in the v-block. But as you can see I don't have a lot of room here to work with and that's what this larger parallel is for because we're going to support our part 
sorry, we're going to support our part so that we can have access to that edge. But I can't hold this against the vise, and that's why I have these small parallels. And I'm just going to insert one there to start with because I have to hold this at the same time that I'm setting up. And that's why it's nice to figure all this out ahead of time. So now I have my two small V blocks set up. I have my large V block and it's supported on the parallel so it's got nowhere to go. It can't go down. Uh, this is holding it also and as you can see this small parallel, well I didn't really need it. It was just a the position these to start to hold them a little off the ground but that's fine we're good to go here except for the tightening up so we're going to have to give it a good tight down here make sure that everything is well positioned and you can see we have access here so we're good to go So it still has to be deburred, but here's my part and we can see that we have our nice 45 on one edge there. So now we have to move on to the mill to square up a tertiary surface and then we're going to be cutting off parts. But there's a sequence to that. So let's go take a look at that. As you can see, I've aligned my vice jaw parallel to the axis of the table to within one thousandth of an inch. Now, some of you suffer from a condition that's called tolerance on the brain because you're saying, well, it's about three quarters of a thou out here. And that isn't important. This is good enough. Why? Well, I'm going to be side milling the end of my bar here. And I'm going to do it in this sense. So it's going to be oriented this way. That means that that's less than one inch wide. My vice jaw is four inches wide. So that means that if I'm, let's say, one thousandths of an inch out on that reading, well, on this end, I'll be two and a half, ten thousandths of an inch out. And really, since the outside uh, tolerance on this part on the outside diameter or dimensions is plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. Well, I mean, two and a half tenths is more than good enough.
So I have a 5 8 of an inch cutter mounted in the spindle and note here that the spindle is fully retracted. That is very important and well locked also. If the spindle sticks out, the further it sticks out, the less stable or the more flexible the machine gets. And it's the same for the head. The higher the head is on the column, the less rigid the machine becomes. So what I've done here is I've retracted the spindle completely and locked it tightly in place and controlled or adjusted my depth by using the head of the machine and keeping it as low as possible. So we're ready to start cutting here and we're going to cut the end of the part. But I want this part to sit just proud of the end of the vise and just barely come and lick it to get it nice and square. There's a problem there. I'm sitting on a parallel and I don't want to worry about that parallel moving around and getting hit by the cutter because if it does stick out any it could be uh, hit by the cutter and that well, would damage my parallel and my cutter. So what I've done here and if you take a look down here I've installed a little spring and all that spring does is keep a slight tension on the parallel when I tighten and loosen the vise off so that when I install or retract my part, well, my parallel never moves. It's a little trick. So we're ready to start cutting. So we'll install our part. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to go switch my glasses and put on my safety glasses because when we're cutting, we want to protect our eyes. Well, my primary surfaces are done, my secondary surfaces are done, and well, I just finished my tertiary surfaces. But I have nice square and flat tertiary surfaces, but I just have two, and why did I do both? I mean, I'm going to be going on my cutoff bandsaw and cutting these off to be a little over 0.6 inches, uh, and then I'll finish them on the mill. So why don't I just go and cut them all? Why do I have one good end and another good end? Well, when you cut on the bandsaw, you're going to want to have one good tertiary reference surface. So when I cut the first part off of this end, it's going to have a good tertiary surface so that I can mill the opposite tertiary surface easily parallel. And I can do the same with the other end. So for each time that I go to the mill here, I can cut two parts. Once those two parts have been cut off, I'm going to come back to the mill and mill both ends again. And then go back to my cutoff saw. I'm only going to lay out one end once because I'm going to be setting up the stop on my bandsaw. So all the other parts will come, up, come out approximately the same size. So let's go lay this out. So here I have my part and it's leaning up against an angle plate and it's sitting on a 1-2-3 block. Now why is it sitting on the 1-2-3 block? Well that's because this type of height gauge doesn't go under one inch. 
So if I want 0.6, and that's what I want here, I'm going to have to set my scale here at 1.6 and raise my part by 1 inch. So let's scribe this. So here's my part. It's just barely snug in the vise, so it can't skew. Now I can see my line here. I'm going to bring the blade down and I'm going to position it so that it's just proud of that line. Why? Well, because I want to leave some material on there for finishing because I want this to be nice and square. So that is where I want it. I can tighten that down and now I'm going to come and adjust my stop. But I brought along this parallel and it's there for a reason. It's so that I can abut my stop onto it. Now, getting that lined up there, that's nice and tight. And here's my parallel. Why that parallel? Well, when these parts get cut off, they can jam themselves uh, between the blade and the stop, and that can break your blade. So, by adjusting it with the parallel like this, you'll never have a problem with jamming. But, you have to remember to use your parallel each time you set this up. So let's take this cut. So there, I have two, or my first two parts cut off, and both has a nice reference surface on its tertiary side. So, what do I want to do? Well, I still have this bar, but this bar has no good reference surfaces in the tertiary direction anymore. So what I'm going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is deburr because I cut it on the saw. I don't want burrs skewing things around here. So I'm going to deburr the ends. Then I'm going to come back to my mill and just clean both ends the same as I did the first time. And then I'll go back to the saw, cut two more pieces, and so on and so forth. Now, I have my eight pieces almost finished. There's one tertiary surface left to go. And we have a good reference on each of the other tertiaries. So, all I have to do now is put these parts in the mill, a good side facing down on a parallel, and surface the second tertiary down to its final dimension. And for that, well, I'm using a facing carbide mill milling cutter, I should say. So, let's take a look at that.
So, I have my eight semi-finished parts and quite a mess to clean up. So, until we meet again, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.